listening to the NYC Taxi News Podcast. This is Abe. I'm Abe. And I'm here today with Carolyn, Auto Marketplace's Doward. Back to the popular demand today's special guest, Taxi Day Pollock. Hello, who's everybody. Well known in this industry. Yeah, who's well known in this industry. And, uh, you know, he, he, his uh, saying has always been uh, that he bleeds yellow. And uh, I believe yellow also, so we have uh, we're blood brothers, okay. But I didn't and, uh, have James Brown in my cab. <laughs> yeah, you saw that on Facebook, right? I, I did. Yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to sell that uh, autograph, okay. By the way, <laughs> all right. But but I won't take less than twelve thousand five hundred dollars, okay. So. If there's anybody out there who who's a uh, autograph, um, uh, you know, a maniac, all right, uh, and got plenty of money to spend, call me. Okay. Anyway, uh, we will uh, lend his uh, Dave and everybody else will lend our expertise to the conversation, having been a participant and observer in our business for many years. That's that's actually Dave. Okay. But first. We'll try to sum up where we've been over the past year and where we might be going in 2024. And Carolyn, I believe you want to step in right now. Thank you, Abe. Um, All right, get your sharpened pencils out and your notebooks because here's a few highlights of the last year. Uh, Numbers of TLC licensed vehicles, 102,000 for high vehicles. That would be black, high volume, green, livery, luxury, all of them together. So you mean to tell me, Carolyn, you mean to tell me that after close to 10 years of us trying to get a reduction of vehicles on the streets (laughs) because there wasn't enough business, do you mean to tell me there are still over 100,000 licensed FHVs? Yes, and since David Doe's not here, I'll tell you what his response is to this. But there was 120,000. We were up to 120, and now there's only around 100. So see, there's been a reduction. Yeah, but my argument is, and yours, and anybody sensible who knows this business, is 120 is too many, 100 is too many. 50,000 might be the right amount, you know, which is what it was probably like around 2012. Um, But anyway, so that's 102,000 FHVs, which is 10,000 more than two years ago. There's just short of 9,000 yellow taxis, which is about 4,500 less than two years ago. Total trips by all sectors in October 23, about 817,000. This is not enough to justify 110,000 vehicles with the possibility of many more to come online due to the TLC EV exemption which would allow unlimited numbers of EV FHVs. Um, Just an aside, it's interesting to compare September to October numbers. This is actually positive for yellow. There's 1,000 more Uber lifts on the road daily and 10,000 less trips per day. Interesting. There's 1,000 more yellows on the road comparing September to October and to almost 20,000, I think it's actually 18, I was rounding, forgive me, more trips per day. Now, I mean, this could be a one-off, we don't know, but I thought that was worth mentioning. There is a lawsuit that was initiated by the Taxi Workers Alliance against the EV exemption. It's still ongoing. There's a temporary restraining order that prevents the TLC from issuing more plates other than the several thousand that drivers have already applied for prior to the cut-off date, unfortunately. Uh, The number of medallion foreclosures since 2014 is 2,881, of which 288 occurred in 23. So we'll probably be around 300 for this year. Um, The TLC has not ever released the legally required studies on the financial health of the taxi industry, which I believe they're mandated to perform. Um, TLC held a hearing in November on increasing the initial taxi improvement fund payment directly to dealerships and converters to subsidize wave taxi purchases. They increased it, or they may increase it, they haven't voted on it yet, from 14000 to 20000 but decreasing the yearly maintenance payment from 4000 to 1000 
So you lose money. And also they might be requiring wave taxis to remain on the road for five years instead of four years. That's um, a good thing. By the, by the way, there has been no publicly released accounting on the Taxi Improvement Fund since the spring of 2022. They're collecting $40 million a year. It's not that complicated. You know how much came in. You know how much went out. So you know what the balance is. I'm sure they know, but they have not released that publicly. We um, used to get that issues, if quarterly, if not monthly. We used to get those figures. New York City is losing population, yet we're in a housing crisis at the same time. We have a $12 billion hole in the budget over the next three years. Congestion tolling is supposed to start in the spring of 24. The TMRB has recommended to the MTA that taxis, black cars, I'm not sure about liveries, but taxis and black cars would collect $1.25 per trip in the zone below 60th Street, while Uber and Lyft would collect $2.50, in addition to the previous congestion fees that we've been collecting since 2019. Um, there's still going to be hearings. There's lawsuits. So who knows what's going to happen with that. Um, meanwhile, in the midst of all these problems, the Adams administration is under a cloud of scandal involving building Ooh. inspections that are alleged to have been prioritized for entities that have ties to the mayor. The Ooh. list of these entities is called the DMO list. DMO stands for Deputy Mayor of Operations. The current DMO is former TLC Chair Mirazoshi. The current, head, the current head of the Buildings Department is James Odo, who previously was Zoshi's Chief of Staff while she's um, Deputy Mayor. Some of this may go back to the previous administration. Laura Anglin, who's deceased, was the former deputy mayor for operations. Her chief of staff was Aloysi Heredia Jarmashuk, who went on to become the TLC chair after Zoshi's departure. After Jarmashuk left to become TLC chair, Yumi Kitase, who, by the way, is a science fiction writer, became chief of staff. She is now chief of staff to Deputy Mayor Sheena Wright. See, see it's very insidious. <laughs> I mean, maybe this is a little too inside baseball, but, you know, it's like the same players just going around and around. Um, there are also ongoing investigations regarding campaign contributions. Uh, is there any there there? That remains unknown. There is an ongoing investigation by the FBI, the Manhattan DA, Department of Justice, Southern District of New York, the mayor has had his iPhones, his uh, his phones and iPads seized by the FBI. And by the way, seized is is serious because sometimes they just ask you, sometimes they subpoena you, and sometimes they nab you when you're walking down the street, escort you to your car, get in the car with you, and take your phones, which is basically what happened to Adams. Um, but you know we don't know how that's going to turn out. There've been many mistakes by the Adams administration. To be fair, he was. He also been dealt a terrible hand. Uh, there are two ways that people deal with mistakes. One is they acknowledge them, define them, and then change or modify course. Or, which seems to happen in New York City, they double down on bad policies. Or is there going to be a regime change? And would that even make any difference in a city that seems to have sold itself cheap to corporate interests? I'm done. <laughs> And then I think so they bad. installed a new BAP signal, right? I think a BAP signal has been installed. <laughs> a BAP signal? Batman, to call BAP. To call oh, Batman right, 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 right. Point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to tell all your listeners that you're not going to get all of this information about the taxi industry encapsulated, put together <clears throat> so finely, item by item, as you get from um, – Abe's podcast that you're listening to now, and thanks to Salomon for putting this all together. There's so much, uh, so much to talk about. Um, the first thing you mentioned were the number of TLC licenses being 102,000 for FHVs, I should say, 10,000 yeah. more than two years ago, and 9,000 yellow taxis, about 4,500 less than two years ago. Um, when... I mean, I remember with the medallions and storage, there were about 7,500. 
I guess about five years ago, about 7,500 yellow cabs yeah. on the road, yeah. roughly half of them. The other half had their medallions in storage at the taxi commission. So there's been uh, a bit of an increase of the number of yellows out. But still, yeah. 9,000 out of 15,000, it's disgraceful. You know, you want to help the other, you know, you want to help the population um, get around in New York City? Get those other yellow cabs on the road. It's ridiculous. Yeah, we, evidently people um, want them. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing 20,000 more trips a day from September to October. That's a huge increase. Let, let, me just, uh, let me correct that figure, Dave. You said 9 out of 15. It's 9 out of 13, right? I'm sorry. You're right. 13,000 and change. 500, exactly. About uh, 13,500. I mean, I think so, the one thing that so we, third, we've spoken it's, it's absurd, and I think one thing we've we've spoke about in this podcast is this recent decision. I think what really – things were getting better. You know, I was – you know, we were talking about the – I talked to the tax medallion brokers. Transactions were happening. Investors were coming in. I should also mention – I'm going to write an article about it. Marblegate is delaying its listing. The SEC vote is – I think they either took it or it's coming up. So they're going to try to list it maybe in October. This is the second delay, undoubtedly – all of this surprise regulation has caused them to delay it. So, so many things have gone on with this vehicle number. And I think, uh, Carolyn, you hit the nail on the head when you said that David, though, keeps on referring to 120,000. In fact, the real number is 114,000 pre-pandemic because 6,000 had naturally, there was natural attrition of 6,000 mm. before the pandemic. And if you layer all of this on, fundamentally trip demand is lower than it was pre-pandemic still by, for yellow cabs, it's way lower. For FHVs, it's at least, you know, 15% lower, you could say. And then another thing I wanted to mention before handing it over to the next speaker is this medallion stability report. And I wrote an article about it, and, and thanks to you, Carolyn, uh, you actually got, um, we had mentioned it before on the podcast, actually. And then Doris came out saying that, you know, where is this report? I don't understand fundamentally how any policy can be made on FHV supply when they're not even making the required reports. That doesn't make any sense. Well, they may have made the report and, you know, if for internal consumption within TLC, this is just a guess on my part, but not released it publicly. And let me but just isn't the requirement that, to release it publicly? Isn't it the requirement to release it publicly? Uh, you know what, I haven't read. I, I don't know if it's in the local laws and in the administrative code. I don't feel like looking through that. Sometimes they pass rules, but they're not in the administrative code. Sometimes they are. And in, in any case, unless somebody's checking up on them, nobody really cares. And as a for instance of that, the TLC allowed Uber, Lyft, and whoever the other high-volume services were at the time, Juno, I think, was one. They allowed them to operate for two years without a license. I mean, they'd already passed the rules, you know, passed the laws, um, that they had to be licensed as high volume for higher services, and they just never did it. They just let it go for two years. So unless somebody's, you know, really holding their feet to the fire, they just do whatever they want, you know, which is basically what's been happening for years. And I will say the entire Adams administration is infested with ex-TLC people, starting with Mira Zoshi, Bill Heinzen, Madeline Labadi, uh, Dawn Miller, um, the guy who's head of the corrections department. I always forget his name. It's a Spanish name. I can't think of it. Um, so there's all these people who used to work at the TLC who are now within the, uh, the Adams administration. So, you know, they're there. So, you know, just changing a TLC commissioner or, you know, maybe even a mayor. I don't even know if changing a mayor would make any difference. They'll probably just still be there. <laughs> And, and remember that when de Blasio was mayor, a lot of his heads of agencies were left over from the Bloomberg administration. Yes. So indirectly, yes. you still have Bloomberg yes. sitting in politics at City Hall. Exactly. And directing. Yeah. And we know the guy, the he, guy who is the head of the TMRB, you know, working on what the congestion pricing should be. Carl Weisbrod, I believe, was oh, deputy mayor under Bloomberg. I think he was. 
Right, and now he's he with was. HRNA Advisors, which, you know, people from HRNA, people who work for the city, they go back and forth and back and forth. They're very, very influential. You know, I mean, when he, I was he, active, he, when I was active by the congestion pricing, um, the initially when congestion pricing was going to happen some, I don't know, six years ago, eight years ago, ten years ago, um, the Committee for Taxi Safety at the time, we were able to get an exemption for yellow cabs. Uh, now, there's virtually no political entity, I mean, who representing the, the drivers and the owners who could really fight for it. I mean, Taxi Workers Alliance aside. Um, and it just... And I forgot where I was going with that. I just had a CRS well, to moment. Be, to Dave, on, 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 that, on that point, Mayor Adams uh, uh, has actually, he's going to fight for the two yellows, what he calls school buses and uh, yellow cats or an exemption. It might be too little too late to your point. But I think we've been talking about this kind of this revolving door. And I think, you know, I personally call that, you know, David Doe should uh, resign from the TLC chair. But I think Carolyn's making a good point that, okay, it's kind of like, well, if you if he resigns, who replaces him? Is it just like a carbon copy of him, you know, with a different name sort of thing? I think one interesting case study that happened very recently is the ability to use city council to override TLC policy. So did you see two days ago they approved in-vehicle advertising for FHE? Yes. Yeah. And that was a, that's a really good case study where the TLC went on record two months ago in city council saying that they were against in-vehicle advertising and then Amanda Farias with kind of this interesting coalition of IDG and NITWA and even like a rental company and Uber and Lyft, very interesting coalition, they actually approved in-vehicle advertising. So one mechanism to use right now is actually this 51 you know, the city council is one way to kind of change the politics and override, you know, bad policy at the, at the commission level, if you will. The in, like, advertising inside the car for FHVs, I know the black cars would probably be against that. They have high-end clients who like to feel they're in a limousine, even though it's not a stretch limo. But it's, you know, one of those Lincolns or Escalades, you know, Escalades, et cetera. <clears throat> it's not and, required. Uh, it's not required. It's, it, but you have the option to do it. What the TLC was doing before is, let's say a driver wanted to do it. They're saying, no, you can't do it. You said driver. Who does the money go to? The driver or the owner of the vehicle? Well, well, the driver uh, gets 25, uh, 25%. 25 percent. Bill exactly. That they, That's that the, the, the minimum. Right. It's amazing and most, how and in the that F bill passed. And in, in the FHV industry, about 70% of the cars are owned by the drivers, and then about 30% are owned by effectively rental companies. But in the bill, to Carolyn's point, 25% will be siphoned off to the driver. And that's a minimum. That's a floor. You know, so that's a, if that's there's a good four competing. The absolutely. It's a great thing. But what's really weird, Dave, is that two months ago in city council testimony, the TLC was railing against this. They're saying, no, it's not good. There's no benefit to the driver without any evidence. So it's a really interesting example of the TLC saying that we are against this. And then the city council saying, okay, we heard you, but we're going to go ahead with it anyways. Well, somebody had a lobby for it. It was probably the uh, New York City Taxi Workers Alliance in New York, I think. I don't know who else would lobby for that. Well, it's a there, way there was, to entice uh, more drivers to stay on. So you never get rid of these people, and that would be to Uber's benefit to have the largest group was, of drivers and cars. Exactly, and also there Lyft has a business. Well, I'll tell you exactly who it was. There's Independent Driver Guild, which is another big union now. Night 12, Lyft is in this business. They actually have an in-vehicle tablet, so they have a business in this now. Uber is kind of getting to this business. They have, they have taxi top ads. They're in that business now. And um, Octopus, which is owned by T-Mobile, they have a business in this. So, and then the rental companies, because the 30% that the cars they own, they're also going to get a cut if they can make a big deal with a Lyft or Uber or Octopus or, um, you know, Vugo, which is another one. So 
so there's definitely in, money incentives, but fundamentally, it, David though keeps on saying he was on a podcast with the Agape founder, who's a very nice gentleman, and he's like a you know a, 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 I've met him before, Mario Senna. But in that, he keeps on saying that, you know, predat he keeps on using this annoying term predatory leasing or I'm for the driver earning more money. But yet, when an opportunity arose to have the driver earn more money, the TLC, and they didn't explain it. They said, we're against in-vehicle advertising because there's no benefit for the driver. It's like, based on what? Based on your gut feeling? Like, all the drivers are telling you that there's a benefit. So it's very confusing. Well, yeah, there was a, you know, st statistics were done when, you know, Uber came along and had to um, guarantee a certain amount of income for the drivers. So this, if it's used towards that income, advertising, um, maybe Uber was behind this to help them. I, that's a really guarantee. interesting, that's a really, I don't think it is, but that's a super interesting point you made, where is this, income included in the driver minimum pay from my reading of the bill it is not but that's actually a really interesting point you made but well, if uber's in the tablet advertising business they're also benefiting that way yeah and that's what uber has chosen to concentrate on in the future according to their quarterly and annual reports is that they think that's the real growth area for them is advertising well they're advertising yeah. in the app they're making a lot of money you know so I mean, it's, and they're also into taxi top ads. I believe they own a lot of yellow, uh, Uber and Lyft own a lot of the rights to the yellow cab taxi top ads now. Yeah, I see them all over the place, yeah. Can you repeat that? What about the yellow taxi top ads? What did you say about Uber and the taxi top ads? So Uber and Lyft basically have acquired the rights for a lot of those, uh, those taxi tops. Like the, they're selling the right, you know, if someone wants to ad, uh, advertise on those taxi tops, Uber and Lyft own the rights to many of those. Holy I think Curb Mobility cow. might be another big player. But, yeah, I mean, Uber, yeah, I, I mean, that, they, was, yeah. that was the deal that Ron Sherman made. Um, oh, TV okay. I believe it's those cabs, but it might be some others. Wow. Yeah, so this yellow no, cab driving up and down Manhattan with Uber advertising on the top of the yellow cab. <laughs> so, uh, I'll look give you, I'll look give at the you, irony. Uh, yeah. Exactly. It's very ironic. I mean, I want to ask you guys something because you guys have been in the yellow cab industry so long. So I was uh, having a kind of a, on Twitter or an X, a back and forth with Josh Golden. I'm set, and, I, and I told him, I said, listen, you got to expect the yellow cab medallion guys are going to fight for their industry. So, you know, when you, you know, what is your thinking around that? And so the answer he said is that with the yellow cab, basically I'm paraphrasing, he said that the yellow cab industry needs to focus, the garages need to focus on enticing drivers to drive yellow again. And I wanted to get your guys's, because it's not my necessarily area of expertise, do you think the yellow cab garage industry, the yellow cab owners, you know, the people who own the medallions, do they need to do more to entice drivers, like lower the lease rates or you know, give them more incentives. What, what's your thoughts on that? I'm glad you brought that up, David. Let me just tell you something. It's not the garage's responsibility. Do you think someone wants to drive yellow when there's an add-on? Now, how many add-ons? But when a passenger sits in the yellow cab, okay, if it's someone who is watching every nickel, I don't know how they're going to. Maybe they'll get on the subway. But all those surcharges – all of those surcharges. You have surcharges on every cab ride for wheelchair accessible. Now, the irony, once again, you know, we, we used to have a saying, if it doesn't make sense, the TLC will do it. So here we have a $12 billion hole in New York City's budget over the next three years that Carolyn brought to light. And the congestion tolling is supposed to start um, within the next six months, let's say, but the irony here, once again, is that's going to be congestion pricing. From what I'm hearing right now, yellow cabs will probably be charged one time a day going into that, uh, going in below 60th Street. And here's the irony. The money isn't even going to the city who desperately needs the money. The money's going to the MTA. It's ridiculous. It doesn't make any Excuse sense. Excuse me, the latest I've uh heard on the taxis is 
they're going to charge each passenger a dollar twenty-five more on every trip. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that, yeah. That, yeah, that's every, right. They're yeah. doing a passenger per trip surcharge. But Dave, to your point, no, only when they're in the zone. Still... Only when you're in the zone. You know, another dollar twenty-five when they're below sixty. Exactly. Per, they're already, per trip they're already paying. They're already paying two dollars and fifty cents when they're below ninety-sixth Street. Yeah. Eight. Basically, it starts so, the meter at eight bucks if you're going in the zone. I think, right? That's to Dave, what to I Dave's wanted. point. Right. And so, so my question is that if you're if you're a driver, because uh, the way I started, Dave, in this industry is I ran a luxury leasing company, um, and so I deal with a lot of drivers. And I was in the operating part of the business for quite a long time before I started Auto Marketplace. Is that you today you have a TLT driver. So I'll give you a real life example, non hypothetical, two real life examples. A driver came to me. He said, I'm looking for a car. I said, there's no cars I know available. I said, why don't you go to a yellow cab garage? And that driver said, I'm not interested. I don't like doing yellow cabs. I don't like the street hail work. And so he just doesn't want to do the yellow cab. Although that's it would he would make more money uh, financially and everything it would make more sense. Now, here's a bit of good news for the yellow cab industry. I'm helping some people interested in buying medallions have reached out to me. They've read my articles. I have a person right now who's on the verge of buying a taxi medallion, and it's a very quirky situation. Basically, the father is a retired yellow cab driver. He's sitting at home. He's going crazy. So he's just driving yellow cab for the heck of it. And he's like, huh, maybe I should just buy a yellow cab medallion because I'm paying $900 a week to the garage. I can, he can right now. By the way, the current price for a medallion has gone down to a selected medallion has gone down one hundred two thousand five hundred. By the way, Ooh. you know, so so this electric vehicle. Remember when I wrote that article that electric vehicles would damage the medallion industry? I, I've been speaking to medallion brokers, and that is exactly what happened. And so, it, it to pull this all together, how do you drive? I think if the yellow cabs are out there, the passenger, it's a little bit of, a bit of if you build it, they will come, if they, especially with the data you're uh, showing, because there is a perception, even amongst the younger generation, that yellow cabs are cheaper than Uber. It's like viewed as the cheap option to go in a yellow cab. But how do you get the drivers to embrace yellow cabs? You know, that, that's like a big question going on. So one way is to say, okay, um, limit the FHV so the yellow cab industry can recover and drivers can get trained in that industry again. Um, but then maybe there's something more that can be done, you know, but maybe I'm wrong on that. Like, Abe, well, I'll give you an example. It, if, yeah. it would help if they give yellow taxis an exemption from any further congestion fees, which has been done in many cities around the world, that in those cities they do charge Uber, congestion fees, but they do not charge the taxi industry because they're different. They're not similarly situated. But we don't know, you know, how that's going to pan out in New York City. Probably they'll leave it at $1.25. I'll give you another interesting idea. So I used to live in London, and I believe black cabs can use the bus lanes in London. Yes. So, yes. For, yes. for example, another thing New York could do is, like, the thing I think everybody's concerned about, I don't own a medallion, never owned a medallion. I've been in this industry from, like, a, like from the luxury leasing side, but then, you know, I got into different parts, is that I think anybody who's honest in this industry, if you just forecast what's going to go with the, uh, going to happen with the yellow cab industry if policy's not changed, it is not a good forecast. And if NYTWA loses this lawsuit, where the EV exemption is reinstate, like reinstated for the second time or the third time, I should say, however you want to define it, I don't want to sound hyperbolic. That is almost, you could say, the second final nail in the coffin, if they allow that, because it will flood the streets. Because as electric cars get cheaper, and there's also not even enough charge, there's other issues with electric cars, which we've gone over uh, so many times, but that is such a big deal. I don't think the yellow cab industry, maybe some people are realizing it, but this EV exemption lawsuit, this is such a huge deal for the yellow cab industry. Just to tell everybody what an EV is, simply it's an electric vehicle, total electric vehicle, correct? Yes, that's right, 100%. Now, what had happened was, 
and you probably covered this on a prior pod, podcast, on October 19th, um, New York City opened up its licensing again for for higher vehicle license from a qualifying person, I guess, or a corporation um, that had an electric vehicle. And what happened at that time was it was quite reminiscent of what the TLC lines looked like right after the yellow medallion auction. Within a month after the last medallion auction, which fell apart basically because most of the people – or, or a large percentage of the people backed out of their deals, lost, gave up their deposits because they saw what was happening with Uber. And literally, lines were out the door at the Taxi and Limousine Commission building in Queens where licensing was and around the corner. So I have it on good authority that between October 19th and then when the New York Taxi Workers Alliance of New York uh, filed a lawsuit to stop the TLC from issuing electric vehicle uh, FHV licenses. And that stopped the TLC cold in their tracks on November 13th. Now, just to, so you understand, the Taxi and Limousine Commission is open Monday through Friday. So from October 19th to November 13th, who knows how many days there were, but 10,000, approximately 10,000 applications were submitted to the Taxi and Limousine Commission to affiliate their electric vehicles with some type of base, which I believe you have to do in order to have any type of FHV vehicle. 10,000 new vehicle applications processed by the Taxi and Limousine Commission. Now, someone had mentioned there may be a problem getting insurance on those electric vehicles. Well, you should know that I can't speak for all the insurance companies out there. In fact, I can't speak for any insurance company, but I do know that the guidelines instituted by one um, company want more qualified drivers. Okay, this is a new type of business for them, but the company that I'm talking about is Hereford. They've been, in my opinion, um, the most responsible or as responsible as any other insurance company in this taxi industry to do things the right way and manage it. And with qualifications that are needed for better drivers, you don't, you know, they don't want to take drivers that are that had two or three accidents. They don't want to take drivers who had no experience driving an FHV in New York City. Okay, they want well-seasoned, qualified drivers. And as you said, Davoud, it seems that you were insinuating that yellow drivers who have been driving for a long time or like that father paying 900 a month could either buy a medallion with his son or he's saying, why should I pay $900 a week? I'm sorry. Why should I pay that? I could buy an EV and drive my own car, associate with a vase, and make all the money for myself. Uh, I don't think those people have looked at the amount of business that's out there. Uh, if they're listening to this podcast, I guess, Carolyn, they can do your math. And it's, my it's question to you is, what do you, what do you think of the 10,000 EV applications submitted in less than one month before they were stopped by the uh, injunction by the lawsuit, what do you think about an additional 10,000 FHVs at this time? I think those drivers aren't thinking this through. Um, if, if drivers doing 10 trips a day and then you start adding all these additional cars, you're only going to be doing nine trips a day. Like you need to think about that as a driver, and certainly the TLC should be thinking about that. Like where do they think these trips are going to come from? was still not even up to, you know, the number of trips pre-pandemic. If anything, they're going have, down. So you know, where, where is this Davood. additional work going to come from? I have to ask Davood one question. Do you still see on the streets FHVs picking up street hails? So the street hail, that's a really interesting question. I, I think the numbers are 10 to 15% of the market is still like a street hail market. Oh, you're talking about illegally. You're talking about if 
non-yellow cap FHVs doing street hails? Yes. Oh, okay. On in Manhattan, I live in Manhattan. I don't see it in Manhattan that much. At the airports, I see it all the time. Like if you ever go to like JFK or uh, especially JFK, I haven't, I haven't flown out of LaGuardia that much. But JFK, it's like happening. I don't understand. If they sent one TLC enforcement officer, he would be awarded officer of the year. If they just sent him to JFK <laughs> to enforce like obvious illegal hailing at the airport. I don't know who's like what. It's such an obvious thing uh, to to identify and uh, and see. Um, on on that point about the driver's mentality, I know the FHV, this new kind of Uber and Lyft industry well. This is why I'm trying to connect the dots when, you know, when David Doe, and I, you know, again, I sometimes it, it sounds like I'm attacking him. He was on the, he's a nice enough guy. When he uses these terms like the predatory leasing companies, the predatory this, it's really disingenuous because it's like, you're saying it's predatory, but then when the driver owns the car and he has a $5,000 transmission bill or his EV battery goes down, all of a sudden he's done. Like that driver is done. He doesn't have the financial capacity versus a rental company. You know, he can just return the car, get another car. I'm not saying the driver should have an option, but what there's a hysteria being created. Like get your TLC plate like it's a medallion. And that's what people are not realizing that this hysteria is being created where it's like, oh, these SOB rental companies, you know, um, and then it's like, oh, the TLC plate is open. Let me grab one before it closes again. It's like you TLC, you don't realize you are creating a, a medallion like asset when you can do FHV, FHV lease caps. Um, you know, there's other ways to approach it, which we've gone over. But fundamentally, if you, that policy will lead to the medallion being worth almost nothing, like you cannot do two policies and be like, I wonder what the results will be. So that's why this EV exemption thing, whatever the judge rules, it's really in her hands. And then it's in the TLC hands that they reinstitute or whatever. And there's one other point I want to make. David Doe says, well, it's night. I don't know if you've heard this. He said it's night was fault that there's 10,000 applications because it caused a, a, like a, you know, a run on the bank type of thing. Right. But bullshit, a, 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 bullshit. Exactly. According to TLC, they said before the lawsuit, there was a hundred a day. It's like, can anybody do math anymore? If there was a hundred a day and there's about 30 days uh, in a month, you would have got 10,000 in like four months. It's like, what is he talking about? Like, so my issue is, is that this is too big of a deal to be like, to leave it up to, oh, it's another like New York City political dance. It's like, you're going to kill a hundred, a near hundred year institution because you're learning on the job. You know, I got to tell you the whole way, the, the way this was done was unprofessional, and the TLC and New York City's policy on electric vehicles for the for hire industry is totally flawed. It's flawed, F-L-A-W-E-D. It is flawed. And let me tell you why. Right now, I'm looking at Indian Point Power Plant up in the little hamlet of Buchanan. They closed Indian Power Point, okay, at the latter end of, of this year, a few months ago. And what most people don't know, and I spoke to an electrical engineer who worked up there, um, Indian Point provided 30% of all the power needed in New York City. Now, they have to make that up somehow. Besides running the lines from Niagara Falls down to downstate to New York, this is what I learned about Con Edison. Con Edison's two biggest plants to make up for some of that 30% are diesel-powered generators, <laughs> which is totally the antithesis, totally the opposite, 180 degrees of being environmentally friendly. So it sounds great for public policy. Oh, we're going to all electric we are going to say, look at, look how we're saving. You're not saving anything because electricity has to come from somewhere. 
And the way it's set up right now, between Cuomo, who sold out uh, Indian Point Power Plant, and the diesel energy that's being used to make electricity in New York City, it's just a dog and pony show, okay? And who is behind this? Who would benefit the most from this? Once again, 10,000 FHVs, sounds like Uber may be behind this once again. You know, I always call them the octopus of politics. They have their arms in everything. And it wouldn't surprise me if that's how this whole thing came down. But don't be fooled. Electric vehicles in New York City, especially when you're talking 10000 a month, where is the power going to come from? Let alone they're going to be making less money. Let alone, oh, you want to complain you can't get insurance? Well, you know what? You should be experienced if you're going to drive in New York City. Okay? But – to be opposite of environmentally friendly is using diesel fuel, and that's what people don't realize. Thank you. That's 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 so well put. And, and the issue with like the TLC is that when you make these points to them, they nod their head, or even the city. I don't want to blame this only on the TLC. I think another angle to this is they want federal grant money from the Biden administration. And just to add to Dave's point, I got another interesting tidbit. My, one of my brothers lives in Washington, D.C., lives in the city, and he just got a hybrid electric car. And so he was going to get fully electric, but he's like, I'm nervous that there's not enough charging infrastructure. The, in the main train station in Washington, D.C., is Union Station. They have maybe two to three chargers in the biggest train station in Washington, D.C. And then... He wanted to charge. Uh, he wanted to install a charger in his building in Washington D.C. And the building manager said, "Well, it's going to cost us two hundred thousand dollars to have ten more chargers, so we're going to hold off because you don't have the money." So what I don't understand is that when you debate these people, like what what you're saying, Dave, what everybody has always said throughout all these podcasts, it's like we're not trying to say we're not trying to be like you know curmudgeons and say like, okay, we're not going to embrace technology. Well, we're simply saying is that, okay, you want to brace electric vehicles. You cannot add electric vehicles, have this chaos occur, and be like, who could have predicted this? It's like this was very predictable. And so if, if I guess the gist of what I'm trying to say is that how do we change this policy? If the policymaker is not willing to listen to the criticism or he's bought out or he's not willing to adjust his – um, view, then what ends up happening is you get sued, and then it becomes whoever's very possible. advising. You're right. Whoever's advising um, Comm- Commissioner Dole, uh whoever's advising him, and that might be Mirazoshi, um, is giving him poor information. If he wanted to deflect from his personal investigation by all those agencies that Carolyn mentioned that he's being investigated on. And he wants this EV uh, vehicle thing to be part of his legacy. Well, your legacy is flawed, and you're going to look like an idiot. I won't say asshole because you're an intelligent man, but you are going to look stupid when it comes out that you're hurting the environment at this point because we don't have the electric infrastructure uh, in New York City to to cover the power. What are you going to, What are you going to do? When, you know, I mean, how are they going to charge at night when they sleep? In apartment buildings, you're going to see wires running out of windows and across the street with extension cords. I mean, how is this, you know, functionally going to work? And you brought up a great point, Daboud. You know, there are not enough charges. Now, I will tell you this. About 20 years ago, maybe 30 years ago now, God, I'm getting old, um, one of I'll mention a Queens medallion had a building or has a building in Long Island city. And they wanted to be the first to put in electric charges in their garage. They had a wall and they said, you know what, if we can only get electric charges here, we'll, we will start buying electric yellow cabs. And this is going back over 20 years ago, let's say 25. So I met with Con Edison and the bottom line, and because you have to go through different agencies, and the bottom line was this. It cost too much to run a private line specifically to charge electric vehicles at that time. 
and they said, oh, it would cost you somewhere in the area of half a million dollars. They wanted Queen's Medallion to pay that money in order to run a line capable of charging cars. I mean, today you see them in different places, shopping centers and uh, malls and places like that. But can you imagine if the city, and we brought it to the Taxi and Limousine Commission back then, no one was interested. No one cared. Okay? If they were interested then, we would already have the infrastructure in place now. So there's a lot of smart people in this yellow industry who have and had the foresight to do things the right way with, with some financial help. So this EV thing, you're not the first guy to think about it, Mayor Adams, you know, and you won't be the last guy. This has been going on for decades. And shame on you for at a meeting, at a public press conference, announcing this as a secondary thing, and the next day, miraculously, hundreds and thousands of applicants turn up to license electric vehicles. Uh, good luck to everybody. It sounds great. I know you want to help the environment. It's a little too soon, okay, to to ride the coattails and the laurels of uh, of the green machine in America. Okay, don't forget yeah. that, this, that this is all dependent on the largesse of the federal government to a large extent. And maybe... You know, that's extent now, but you don't know. There could be a regime change in Washington in another year. Do you think if there's a Republican administration, they're going to be as enthusiastic about EVs? I don't know. Nobody knows. And I should say this. The New York City Department of Citywide Administrative Services, also known as DCAS, um, put out, I guess it's a request for proposal um, to rent battery electric vehicles for the city and also to contract with ride share to provide uh, battery electric vehicles for city workers. We're talking millions, millions of dollars that are going to go to Hertz, uh, Zipcar, Dollaride, Revel Transit getting almost $100,000, Joule. Um, I'm not sure what happened to get around. I don't, maybe they didn't get the contract. But the point is, I mean, there's, there's plans and there's a method behind what's happening. It's not happening randomly. So I think, like I said in the beginning, if you have a bad policy, what do you do? You change it? No, you just double down. You do it harder. You do more of it, which is basically what the city is doing at the moment. And me, all these me, people me, are going to be me, gone. On, these, these people are gone let in me, a couple of years. Let me ask a simple question. of You know, I'm, I'm having a good time listening to three of you, Okay. And and whatever and the things you're saying are, are uh, uh, the correct, assuming they are. I'm sure they are. Okay, these the people that are in, in charge of things and doing all of these things are not going to stop doing it. You know, just because we're sitting here saying all these things. Okay, so one at a time. What do you think? Look at the future five years from now. Okay. How are things going to develop into the transportation in New York City in five years, considering all of the mistakes that people are making? Okay, Dave, I'll, Dave, I'll go, go first. really. Okay, Dave, go. Yeah, go ahead. Dave, go first. No, I'm, I'm listening. I want to hear what yeah. our friends have to say. All right, Dowd, you go. Okay, I'll go. Uh, Okay, so I think there's a few things uh, to way to answer that, and I'll try to be as brief as possible. I think right now we're living in a union time period. So unions, we're right now in America, unions are rising up. So what does that have have anything to do with what I'm about to say? I think NITWA and the Independent Drivers Guild are going to get more and more powerful. And so the driver unions are going to really drive policy. And so this in-vehicle advertising is a small example of how they can circumvent the TLC. I believe this might be totally counterintuitive that the taxi medallion industry, one way or the other, will be able to regain their footing, will, should be able to win this lawsuit. If they don't, that would be a major setback. But if they win this lawsuit, and Nitro's had other wins with the AEG and everything, I think there is a pathway for the taxi medallion industry to recover. 
However, you know, because when you're making a five-year prediction, you say, well, what, are, what would prevent that? What would prevent that is if the TLC and the TLC commissioners and the people who are voting and making policy, if they decide not to say, you know what, we've taken this too far, let's, you know, let's be a little more balanced in our policy, um, then it's just going to be like, you know, you could have like a 1930s taxi riot type situation. Because I'll put it this way, if you're going to kill the yellow cab medallion industry, a, a simple reading of history shows that there will be like, like, pretty much like they'll shut down. You think a 90 year old institution is going to go quietly into the night? They're going to be like, they're going to shut down bridges. They're going to go on hunger strike. Everything is going to go crazy. And so when you're telling me to make the five-year prediction, the way I'm thinking about it is politically. I'm saying, well, if they're going to crush this medallion industry, the five or 6,000 year last of the Mohicans, if you will, right? They're going to cause so much chaos in the city. I mean, they were running after de Blasio in Central Park, if you remember. So from that angle, I don't understand why would the government triple down on killing the medallion. So I think one way or the other, the medallion industry will be saved. Now, if I say, okay, well, how can they be saved? Okay, you exempt them from congestion pricing. Uh, you, you know, you use them, make them use the bus in or other stuff, you know, other benefits. But fundamentally, the for hire vehicle supply must be limited. That has to be the policy. Like, that, why do we have to rewrite history when we already lived the history? Like, it's insanity. We already did the experiment in the 1930s. You know, this happened. Why do we have to live it again in the 2020s? So, um, so I think the, this is the one point I want to function, uh, mention, is that the medallion industry will survive. They'll fight back. And I think electric vehicles will come as they should, but it's going to be over like a 10-year horizon. It's not going to be this uh, Green Rise initiative. They say 100% by 2030. It'll become 100% by like 2040 or 2045. I'll stop there. Dave? Dave, you with us? I've never been one for predicting the future. Uh, one thing I always said uh, when we were in the most dire straits was the yellow cab industry has been here for almost 100 years and it'll continue to be here no matter what happens in New York City. We all know the yellow cab was an icon and it still is somewhat of an icon, although a third of the medallions are in storage at the Taxi and Limousine Commission, which means they're not servicing the public on the road. And how stupid... I mean, it's a sophomoric word, but it's stupidity. You approve EV vehicles. It, does the yellow industry, uh, Carolyn, have the same option? Can I walk in tomorrow and say I have an EV vehicle um, and I want to get a medallion you have in storage? Or, or is that medallion scheduled to be a wheelchair accessible and you can't get an EV vehicle on a yellow? Because that depends on my opinion of the, my prediction of the future of the yellow industry. You know, you want to be, you want to treat it fair. Oh, they're allowing advertising now inside FHVs. Well, guess what? Yellow cabs have had that. And some people would say, you know, the more you make it like a yellow cab, the more it's going to hurt the yellow industry. You know, the next thing that will be allowed is this, the all sacred street hails, which they can't do at this time. So, I think a lot has to do with giving the flexibility and the benefit of a doubt to medallion owners who've already given the city, um, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, over the last, uh, I don't know, 20 years. And so my prediction is the yellow cab industry will be here. I never expected it. I'm glad you told me, Davu, that you're doing a deal now possibly for $102,000 for a medallion. At least there's some value there. You have some big well, players. Well, I'm not, I'm not to be clear, just to be clear for the I'm not buying it. I, someone reached out to me to buy it. Right, right. That's what you had said. I'm sorry. Um, so the medallion industry is still here. Maybe not what we thought it would be. I mean, come on. When the medallion was a million dollars, I mean, any intelligent businessman would say, 
okay, what does the average guy make in a day, make in a week, make in a month, and is it worth a million dollars? I didn't think it was worth a million dollars. You know, the, the right price was probably or between five and six hundred thousand dollars at the time, based on the income. And now you're looking at a bargain at a hundred thousand dollars. So if there's equality, I mean, if I have a chance to just buy a car and be licensed to drive in New York City because it's an EV anywhere, hey, it sounds enticing. Instead of someone leasing a medallion, like you said, someone's paying nine hundred dollars a week. So there's I think there's flexibility. I think the yellow industry, as you predicted, Davood, up the road will become vibrant again and strong again. But there has to be equality in the laws, regulations that the TLC has and the laws and regulations in New York City. And by God, you know, ask some people with brains before you come out with an EV statement like that, because you think you're helping the environment when you're really hurting it. Just ask Con Ed, they'll tell you. Okay, Carolyn, you want to speak? Um, Something that New York City seems to have overlooked. How did Michael Bloomberg balance the budget anytime New York City got a little short? I remember, I remember. They issued more medallions. Now you could do that again if it was apparent to buyers that the city was going to stand behind these medallions, protect the value of the medallions, not have them have equal rights to FHVs, but more rights because we paid to have those rights. You could balance the budget again if you would let, let us use the bus lanes. Don't charge us congestion fees. You know, There's all kinds of things that you could do. I don't see any evidence of them thinking in that direction, but let's see how bad things get because New York City is in a lot of trouble. So if they had any sense, they would protect an asset, which the medallion system is, and then sell a few more, and it's free money for the taxpayers. It doesn't hurt anybody. But for some reason, they just don't want to see that. Steve, how about yourself? What's your prediction? Me? What? (laughs) Who who are you asking? Yes, you. Yeah, yeah. Abe, Abe, what's your prediction? Um, My prediction is um, one way or another, I'm going to eat every day. (laughs) Okay. Um, I I, I have left New York City a long time ago, um, and and I'm glad I did. And, And there are a lot of other people, you know, following me. Okay, and that's mainly because of the way things are going in New York. Okay, uh, I think New York has a lot to do to straighten things out. Okay, and um, I don't really know what's going to happen, and that's why I was asking you. Okay, the first uh, thing New York City right. has to do, as far as as far as population moving down to Florida, you know, that was. Uh, I mean, I'm hearing a lot about that from people in Florida. No, the New Yorkers, you know, the snowbirds are now moving down here permanently. And, um, you know, there's almost a housing shortage down there compared to everywhere else besides a lot of money down there. But what people need to realize is in New York State, they capped the amount of interest on your mortgage that you can deduct on your taxes. Uh, it always used to be anywhere that you can deduct interest on your home if you own a home. If you own a condo, if you own a co-op, if you were lucky enough to do that, all the interest you paid was tax deductible. Well, I guess about seven years ago, I'm guessing, in that area, New York State well, changed it to a maximum of $10,000 that can be deductible. And that alone, that alone continuously drives people uh, well-to-do People, I'll say well-to-do, if you own any type of uh, residence, you're better off not living in New York from a tax perspective. And I'm not a tax expert, so you know, don't quote me, and I don't know if things have changed, but that's pretty much one of the main reasons why people um, have been leaving and moving to Florida. Yet we have such a 
so many new people, so many new immigrants coming to New York, as our ancestors did. My grandparents did, my great-grandparents did uh, with them. And so now you have a new workforce waiting and hoping and praying that they could get a job. What do most people, what are they able to do? They're able to drive. So by opening up the EVs, maybe Adams had in mind putting people to work and not, not even consulting with insurance companies, for example, to find out what the prerequisites would be, uh, what the qualifications would be to help them in advance before going forward with this EV edict. Um, but you're right. You're right, Carolyn. The yellow cab industry, you know, I misspoke when I said we should at least be equal in laws and regulations. No, the yellow cab should be superior. Of course, we bailed out the city with over a billion dollars over the years. Um, as far as the illegals, again, if there's regime change in Washington, there's going to be a lot of deportations which possibly New York City, New York State may not cooperate with because they don't like cooperating with ICE, with the immigration people. But if some of these people are deported, you're going to lose your workforce for food delivery, which is a good thing in my book. The 65,000 Deliveristas doing probably 500,000 um, lithium bike or moped deliveries a day in New York City. They're clogging up the streets. They're in the bus lanes. They're you know, threatening pedestrians. They're, it's a total mess. So if you stop the illegal immigration, you're going to stop that business in its tracks. That's going to be very interesting to watch. Because if you notice, if you look at pictures or video of the hotels where they put the illegals in, there's, they're lined up in the streets, you know, mopeds and um, e-bikes. That's what they're doing. They can rent a, an identity if it's even necessary to do that. You know, there's always some guy who has, you know, a green card or a social security number or something. So they, you just rent it from the guy who's legitimate, and you go to work. That's what they do. They're already working. And that's another yeah, reason why just, the city just, is just such a disaster. Just to add on the, on the legal immigration, I think the, the really big and fundamental point on that as well is that we're now starting to cut – because it's 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 not fully responsible for the budget deficit in the city, but it's a a large it driver of it. You know, it's a right? lot. Yeah. So when people, you know, everybody's empathetic, and obviously America, the city, like you said, is built on immigration, legal immigration for the most part. But let's say also people fleeing, you know, refugee stuff like that. The only thing is, you start entering a different zone when like firefighters are being cut and like the police department is being cut because you can't control immigration. That's like you're crossing the line then. And so that really needs to be contained. Um, so, you know, let's, let's see what happens. That's a, that's a major issue. But just to clarify, it's extremely hard for an, uh, for a undocumented immigrant to do key. It's almost impossible for them to do TLC work, but they can do food delivery work. It's easier. Yeah. Which is what they're doing. And that's very nice for Uber Eats and DoorDash and Grubhub. It's a subsidy for those corporate predators, plain and simple. You know, that's wonderful. Now did you, in these multi-billion dollar corporations. Great. Well, I mean, there can be prosecution brought that if obviously if someone is illegally employing someone and, you know, uh, doing all of this stuff, but also on Uber Eats, I don't know if you followed it, but they passed a minimum pay standard for the food delivery workers and now, from my understanding, I'm not an expert in the industry, there's like a waiting list to sign up for Uber Eats and DoorDash and everything in New York City. It's just a very recent thing they did. Yeah. But getting back to the budget, we won't get into this in detail today, maybe next time, but um, I've discovered a website within the New York City system called checkbooknyc.com. And you could go in there and you can look to see who's paying who and how much and what for. And it is just astounding when you start to look at all the different agencies, including TLC, DOT, and Department of Education is a really big offender, on how much money they spend on consultants. Like, don't they have in-house people to do things anymore? No, they have to hire consultants. 
to, you know, have thoughts about anything. And there's so much wasted money. For instance, Department of Education paid $2.8 million to Uber for ride share. <laughs> you know, like what's going on with that? Um, Is that to do with the I... school bus shortage, the school bus driver shortage? No, no, because that, well, well, they thought there was going to be a strike and Uber was going to come in and schlep students. Which brings up a whole other question is why are so many students even on school buses? 20, 30 years ago, almost all students in the United States either walked or bicycled to school. If you lived in a remote area, yeah, there was a school bus. But why are we busing students all over the place in yellow school buses in New York City when there's a, a school every few blocks? There's no reason for this. And, you know, what really started me wondering about this was when they were talking about an exemption of congestion fees on yellow, yellow cabs and yellow school buses. And I thought, why on earth would they even charge yellow school buses? I mean, that seems a little crazy to be charging them a congestion fee. And then somebody said, oh, that's because the yellow school buses are doing lots of other work during other parts of the day besides schlepping the school kids, which I didn't know. Oh, like party buses and things like that? I don't know. Uh, somebody needs to look into that. I mean, all this stuff is just so unnecessary. We just throw money away with, you know, both this, which is what New York City is doing. Somebody needs to give yeah. me a red Sharpie and the city budget, and I'll, I'll fix it for you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot well, of it is I, it looks, crazy. Yeah. I mean, I, well, it looks like I know we're approaching the hour, and I, I know Abe's probably yeah. right, like looking at his watch, and he's like saying, oh, it's an hour. But I just want to say Merry Christmas, everybody, and Happy New Year. And, you know, it's been a great year talking about the industry, and I'm sure 2024 is going to have a lot of fireworks as well. Yeah. And well, I am, I am looking at the clock, and uh, I want to say have, uh, happy holidays to everyone, okay? Um, and... Uh, you know, the years keep rolling by. It seems like um, 12 months isn't a long time. Okay, but uh, I'm still here. Okay, and I wish everyone to have a great new year. Good health to everybody. Yes, happy holidays, everyone. And Abe, thank you for all you do for putting this together with all your technical expertise, which... Yeah, thanks, Abe. And by the way, people, happy holidays. And buy Abe's book. Don't forget. <laughs> uh, let, let's let's go for a ride. Just, uh, just uh, tune into um, not tune in. Uh, 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 Barnes and Noble selling uh, uh, paperback copies now. Okay, and uh, great book. Well, I wrote it. I could say that. Right. And, uh, well, I I have to go now, folks. So let me just uh, try to hail a cab. Hey, taxi! <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Dave. Thanks, thanks, thanks for joining us. Okay, thanks, us everyone. Hey. Bye, guys. Okay, this is Abe, and I want to thank everybody for listening. And I want to uh, thank all of our sponsors. Checker Management, Queens Medallion Leasing, United Taxi, West Bay Medallion Brokers, uh, MV Brokerage, Third Generation Brokerage, and uh, if you want to drive a yellow cab, these are the, some of the people you should get in touch with, and they're going to help you get out of that silly for-hire vehicle and get into a real taxi.